Hey guys, today I'll show you an adventure horror TV series named Survival Game, Igra Navigivani Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with an extreme reality show where 16 participants will spend a month surviving in a remote place in the Siberian taiga with no cellular reception or supplies there. According to the rules, the participant who can reach the end and stay human will get a reward of 1 million euros. The showrunners prepared a gong for the participants. If anyone wants to give up midway, all they need to do is strike it three times and a helicopter will come to take them home. On the first day of the survival challenge, the host organized a warm-up competition, letting everyone get to know each other better. Afterwards, they were divided into two groups and spent the night in two abandoned wooden cabins. Under the omnipresent cameras, everyone showed their best side, occasionally checking on Suren, a participant who got injured in the previous game. The survival game in the wilderness will officially begin the next day. The contestants were jolted awake early the next morning by the loud gong sound. It turned out that Suren, who got injured the day before, couldn't bear the pain in his leg and decided to quit the competition early. To everyone's surprise, ten minutes had passed, but they hadn't seen any crew members, let alone the promised rescue helicopter. A bald man tried his luck and struck the gong, but the result was still the same. As lunchtime approached, everyone started feeling uneasy. Not a single host or cameraman showed up. They wondered if they were supposed to continue the game or not. Some guessed that this might be a test set by the showrunners. The survival game might have already begun. A vlogger felt they were fooled and decided to take the injured Surin to the main camp to confront the show organizer. Another participant, Nikolai, volunteered to join. He sincerely wanted to take Surin to the showrunners for treatment. The remaining participants had no choice but to return to their dwellings and wait for news. After walking a few kilometers on mountain roads, Nikolai and his companions finally reached the showrunners' camp. To their surprise, it was also completely deserted. Everywhere was strewn with hastily abandoned garbage. The vlogger wondered that the crew members should number more than 40. How did they just disappear? Nikolai noticed traces of blood on the nearby grass, and a bad premonition arose in him. The vlogger wanted to look further but stumbled and accidentally fell into a deep pit. He panicked as he discovered dozens of mutilated corpses in front of him. When he managed to climb out of the mass grave, a crew member walked toward him stiffly, only to be shot dead quickly. The vlogger and the others were scared out of their wits, quickly running deep into the jungle. Although the gunshots didn't ring out again, they always felt like someone was following them. The vlogger felt that with the injured Suren, everyone would be doomed sooner or later, so he ran off alone. Seeing Suren's pleading eyes, Nikolai didn't abandon his teammate. Instead, he took him to a nearby cave, instructing Suren to hide in the cave until the enemy left. He himself lay in the nearby jungle. The two of them stayed in place for a good half hour and did not find anyone coming to search. Nikolai immediately ran back to drag Suren out of the cave. It seemed like the killer should have gone after the vlogger. Sure enough, when the vlogger thought he had escaped the enemy's pursuit, he was suddenly pulled down by a strong force. Not long after, Nikolai returned to the living area with Suren. When he stated that all the crew members had been killed, most people thought it was impossible. They wondered if it was a false scenario fabricated by the showrunners. Surin was furious and cursed, while Nikolai was at a loss for words, saying if they didn't believe his bullshit, they could see for themselves. A man in a red cap named Sergei expressed his desire to investigate. However, before the two could get far, armed bandits suddenly emerged from the jungle. Nikolai dodged bullets and ran at full speed, but soon got blocked by a steep slope. At this point, they had no time to think and jump down. At the bottom of the slope was a river. Fortunately, the bandits did not follow them down, but Nikolai couldn't feel relieved, as the bandits' target was likely the participants' living area. Sure enough, while the people waiting for news saw an armed man rush in, they noticed that the vlogger, who had been captured earlier, was following him. It was clear that this selfish man had led them here. All the participants huddled in the corner in silence. The bandits were like savage wild men. A young bandit grabbed Victoria's sexy body, planning to entertain himself in front of everyone. Others were angry but dared not speak, averting their eyes. However, when Victoria revealed her tattoo on her back, the old bandit paused. Victoria warned him where this tattoo came from. The old bandit looked a bit panicked, warning his teammate not to mess around. There would be plenty of opportunities for fun. Victoria somehow dodged a bullet. As night fell, the three bandits once again gathered everyone together. They came up with a sick idea for a show, letting the contestants choose a lucky one to serve the bandits. Everyone was silent and even glanced at the camera. 
A girl stood out from the crowd, thinking that this was the showrunner's trick. But a second after her words fell, she was shot dead. Everyone finally realized that there was no joke and they had truly encountered bandits. The old bandit grabbed Surin from the back, forcing him to choose the lucky one within five seconds. As the countdown ended, Surin was pale and chose Masha, who was closest to him. Masha was scared and trembled and wet her pants. It turned out that the old bandit was even more playful than the young one. He actually used deer antlers to restrict Masha's body. Then, he started his actions in front of everyone. Accompanied by Masha's chicken screams, the contestants were filled with anger, but no one dared to step forward to stop it. After a while, the old bandit pulled a barely conscious Masha outside, planning to wash her clean in the rain and continue his horrifying acts. Suddenly, two figures rushed out of the darkness, knocking down two of the bandits. It was Nikolai and Sergei, who had been out searching for the mass grave previously. The remaining young bandit inside the house sensed something was wrong. At this moment, Victoria seized the opportunity, launching her heavy body onto the back of the bandit. Regrettably, she was quickly thrown off. But the bald man came to her aid, and working together, they quickly subdued the bandit. The game participants had finally been rescued. However, one of the two bandits outside had stopped breathing, and the other was nowhere to be found. The only surviving bandit was the young one inside the house. Everyone realized that this was no longer a survival show, but a bloody game of hunting and killing in the wild. Nikolai rushed forward to wake the young bandit, demanding to know if the show's crew members were the ones who had been killed. The bandit laughed maniacally, asking them if they knew where they were. Masha, who had been tortured, had fury burning in her eyes. She picked up the deer antler from the ground and stabbed it into the bandit's chest. Nikolai wanted to ask more questions, but the bandit only managed to gasp that they were all going to die before he took his last breath. Everyone felt a chill. After a tense night, the bald man and some others buried the bodies of the two bandits. Another group, led by Nikolai, decided to go back to the crew's camp to investigate. To everyone's surprise, the deep pit that had been full of bodies the day before was now empty. The others laughed it off, thinking Nikolai was just trying to fool them. But he noticed many dried bloodstains around the area, convinced that something strange had happened here. The others ignored this and began to search for useful supplies. Victoria moved away from the group, quietly turning on a computer. When she saw the list of organizers on it, she revealed a strange smile. Then, she took out a USB drive hidden in her necklace and began to copy the computer's data. It was clear she had a hidden agenda in participating in the competition. As she gleefully turned around after completing her task, she suddenly found a wild wolf next to her, gnawing on a severed arm. Keeping her cool, Victoria showed a fierce expression, which scared the wolf into dropping its meal. Her eyes remained sharp as she slowly reached for a spray can on the table. Just as the wolf was about to pounce, she lit the spray with a lighter. The ensuing flames scared off the wild wolf. When the group gathered, they realized that the old man, Semyon, was missing. As the occasional roar of wild wolves echoed from the forest, they decided to take the supplies back to the camp first. Unbeknownst to them, Semyon, sensing danger, had abandoned his companions and run ahead. When they returned to the camp, Nikolai and the others were left speechless. Now was not the time for arguments. The most important thing was to decide on their next move. Yesterday, one of the bandits had escaped and could potentially return with reinforcements. Currently, they only had three old-fashioned rifles and limited ammunition. The group decided to leave the area. If they followed the river, they were likely to encounter nearby inhabitants. Just then, the injured Surin hobbled over. Everyone thought that if they took Surin with them, he would slow down their progress. So they decided to make Surin stay behind at their dwelling, waiting for rescue. Surin, shivering with fear, asked what to do if the bandits came back. Semyon only replied he would have to fight them. And so, the contestants left behind their former companion and headed for the river. Masha, who had been traumatized the night before, suddenly declared her intent to stay. Three more people responded in agreement, including Nikolai. He felt that abandoning their teammates was inhumane. Sure enough, while Nikolai and the others who stayed behind were enjoying the warmth of the cabin, their teammates, forced to sleep outside, were awakened by a vicious pack of wolves. They tried to scare them off with torches, but it was no use. Thankfully, the bald man managed to scare off the wolves by flexing his bald head and firing a timely shot. After a night of fear, the group continued their journey along the river. 
An accident occurred when they crossed a log bridge. Two contestants fell into the river while trying to rescue a slipping comrade. The turbulent river swept the two downstream. The bald man was knocked unconscious when his bald head hit a rock during the turmoil. Thankfully, the downstream currents gradually eased, and the two managed to steady themselves against obstacles. The group quickly pulled the bald man ashore and treated him, managing to save his bald life. Just then, they noticed a little girl squatting on a tree stump by the riverbank. Although she gave off a strange vibe, everyone followed her. Half an hour later, they arrived at a human village. They felt a secret sense of relief. Finally, they were saved. However, in the next moment, the little girl suddenly jumped up on the suspension bridge. The contestants were a bit puzzled, left with no choice but to follow the little girl into the heart of the village. The villagers here seemed friendly and would greet them whenever they encountered one. Before long, the little girl led them to the old village chief, who was hospitable, warmly inviting them to go for a sauna first. The bald man was starving and expressed a desire to eat something first. But the village chief refused, saying that only after taking a sauna and getting clean could they enjoy the food on the table. Although it sounded a bit uncomfortable, everyone still complied with the village chief's invitation. After enjoying a relaxing sauna and cleansing themselves, the people gathered around the dining table. The village chief had specially prepared a big pot of roasted bread for everyone. They felt a bit disappointed, but their hunger got the better of them and they polished off the pot of bread. The bald man felt somewhat unsatisfied and thought it would be better if there was some meat. The village chief cryptically assured him not to worry, that it would come soon. As soon as his words fell, everyone felt dizzy and one by one, they lost consciousness on the table. It seemed like the group had become the villagers' prey. When they woke up again, they found themselves in a huge, deep well. Semyon couldn't help but smirk, so they were the meat the village chief was talking about. Sergei shouted for help in desperation, but who would save them in this isolated cannibal village? They didn't want to give up hope of survival and tried to escape in a human pyramid. Unfortunately, the exit was too high from the bottom of the well and they failed multiple times. The mysterious Victoria warned everyone that the most important thing right now was to conserve energy. Sandra, a famous actress, couldn't take it anymore and shouted in a chicken voice towards the exit of the well. She claimed to be a well-known celebrity, willing to meet any conditions if they let her go. Surprisingly, someone responded from the exit and allowed only Sandra to come up. Shortly after, a rope ladder was lowered. Sandra promised that she would save everyone at any cost and then climbed up along the rope ladder. Unfortunately, a whole day passed and there was no movement from the well's exit. The group became desperate. Victoria dug out a fat earthworm from the ground. She moistened it with saliva and without hesitation put it into her mouth. The other contestants were not so lucky. All they could do was endure their hunger and hang on. The next morning, the villagers lowered a large iron pot with a rope. Upon seeing the contents, the bald man was so happy he nearly cried. Inside was a pot full of braised pork. However, the iron ring and blonde hair embedded in the meat caused everyone else to keep their distance, because they knew these were all things from Sandra. The bald man, however, seemed oblivious, chewing on a piece of meat, insisting it was pork. Sergei, on the verge of breaking down, erupted with anger. He then swung the iron pot violently. The bald man was hit twice in his bald head, his body convulsing non-stop. Perhaps only when in desperate situations can the terror of humanity be truly recognized. The scene then shifts to the other participants. Masha, a kind girl who had once been violated by robbers, had already forgiven Suren, who had pushed her into danger. Masha grew up in a church family and had never been in contact with other men, but she was cruelly violated by three thugs. The trauma pushed Masha to the brink of collapse. One night, Masha, who was sleeping by the window, felt she was being coldly stared at under the moonlight. Upon a closer look, it was the young robber she had killed with a deer antler. Since that day, the devilish figure appeared constantly, whether in daylight or darkness. She could always see that man staring at her with vengeful eyes. Masha completely broke down. She was sure that man was seeking revenge on her, so she started looking for weapons for self-defense. Her companions watched with deep worry. To prove these were just her illusions, they planned to take Masha to the place where the robber's body was buried. But when they arrived, Masha fainted because the corpse was inexplicably gone. Everyone felt a chill down their spines. Could it be that the robber had really come back to life? The next day, while a few of them went out to find food, Masha saw the terrifying figure again. In her extreme fear, she kept throwing kerosene lamps at the fireplace trying to die with the devil. 
Before long, the wooden house was engulfed in flames. When her companions returned with food, the house had been reduced to a frame. Kind-hearted but ill-fated Masha had already been consumed by the fire. With their only residence destroyed, Nikolai and the others could only rest in the showrunner's camp. That night, Nikolai, who was on guard duty, suddenly saw a figure running out of the darkness. It was the show's host, who seemed to be traumatized, yelling at people to get him out of here. On the other side, the contestants who were trapped in the deep well had been ignored for two consecutive days. Just when they sank into despair, someone from above lowered a rope ladder. People could not wait to climb out of the well and found that the arrivals were Nikolai and his group, including the show's host. It turned out that Nikolai had followed the host's advice the night before, leaving the main camp with him and following the trail to this secluded village. What puzzled everyone was that all the villagers had disappeared. Even Sandra, who they initially thought had been made into food, was still alive. She was only dazed and trapped in the room. However, when Victoria and Sergei came to the backyard, they found scattered remains on the chopping board. Sandra said that when she woke up, the ornament on her navel was gone. The group wondered if the villagers faked that pot of human flesh to make everyone emotionally break down and kill each other. But why did they suddenly disappear? At this time, the show host ran over with lingering fear, saying that he had captured something terrifying with the camera. On the night before the start of the program, he and a companion went out to play in the wild. When they returned to the camp, they found all their colleagues lying on the ground, motionless. At first, he thought everyone was playing a prank, but those people slowly stood up and approached the two like zombies. Victoria couldn't help but laugh, believing that they were all the tricks arranged by the showrunners. But the next moment, they saw through the camera there was a dense burst of gunfire in the dark. All the staff was shot on the spot. The host pretended to be dead and barely escaped. This also explained why the game participants couldn't find any staff when they woke up the next day. The group was still skeptical about this story. Semyon, however, was adamant that it was a scam deliberately designed by the showrunners, just to make the show more exciting. But the participants who were caught up in it suffered. To verify his hypothesis, Semyon incited everyone to tie up the host. Once this man is in dire straits, other staff will naturally appear. The host was so angry that he was about to explode. The contestants gathered in the cabin to discuss their strategy. Nikolai told everyone that the bodies of the two robbers were indeed gone. Sergei thought it was very likely that they were taken away by wild wolves, but looking at the video records, it didn't seem like it was deliberately staged. After a long discussion without reaching a conclusion, the men had no choice but to go outside and bury the body of the bald man. Sergei, who caused the bald man's death, felt guilty but not regretful. But when everyone returned, they found that the host tied to the tree was gone. The traces on the ground looked like he was forcibly dragged away. Nikolai immediately led people to search. In the pile of grass by the river, they discovered the remains of the host, torn to shreds. At this, everyone was utterly panicked, believing that this could not be another prank perpetrated by the showrunners anymore. Instead, some even speculated that other contestants, driven by the prize money, were trying to intimidate their competition. Some were scared, others angry, and the scene quickly descended into chaos. With no choice, Nikolai fired a shot to silence the crowd. Just then, someone noticed a group of eerie figures appearing on the opposite riverbank. Their limbs were stiff, their faces pale. Even when stones were thrown at them, they showed no response. It wasn't until they crossed the river that everyone realized these were bloodthirsty zombies. With no place to hide, they retreated into the nearest cabin. The vlogger was a moment too slow and disappeared into the horde of zombies. The constant pounding sound resonated in everyone's hearts. Suddenly, a shout came from outside, telling them to get down. Instinctively, they followed the instruction. The next moment, a hail of bullets felled all the zombies. But the following smoke grenade knocked everyone unconscious. The cabin door was pushed open, and a squad of fully armed soldiers rushed in. When the contestant, Tatiana, woke up from her unconscious state, she found that her companions had already left their beds. She looked around in confusion. In the next room, she saw a man emotionlessly ramming into the glass window. Without thinking, Tatiana followed the exit and left the room. There were many monkeys being kept on both sides of the corridor. Just then, an officer came over and asked her to join her companions. It turned out this was a secret research center. When Tatiana entered a room, she found her companions enjoying food at the dining table. The commanding officer, a colonel seeing that everyone was gathered, began to unravel the mystery. It's then revealed that this secret 
secret base was dedicated to virus research. Not long ago, a scientist injected a newly discovered virus into a monkey. The monkey soon showed no signs of life, but when the scientist touched the body, the monkey came back to life. For safety, the lab released a toxic gas to kill the virus, and the diluted gas was released into the air. Unexpectedly, the virus had a high resistance and spread with the wind to the surrounding area, covering several kilometers. Coincidentally, that was the day the showrunners arrived and all the staff were infected, turning into mindless walking corpses. To prevent further spread of the virus, the research base had no choice but to order the extermination of all infected. What happened next was exactly as the host had filmed. As the virus gas gradually spread, the residents of the cannibal village also turned into zombies not long after. This explained why they suddenly disappeared. Everyone was still somewhat puzzled, wondering why the game participants were still fine. But the colonel suddenly changed the subject, telling the actress Sandra that there were quite a few fans of hers in the base, and they hoped to take a photo with her. Sandra agreed, while the others followed the colonel on a tour around the base. The bald zombie in the glass room was the scientist who had been bitten by the monkey. Although he was brain dead, he would still follow his instincts, constantly seeking meat to replenish his energy. At this point, someone suggested calling their families, but the colonel told them that the research lab was in a complete state of secrecy and contact with the outside world was prohibited. Everyone had no choice but to return to their rooms, only to find Sandra, who had gone to take photos with her fans, unconscious in a sealed glass room. The colonel then revealed that a virus had been found in Sandra's blood. The photo op was just a ruse to get her into the isolation room peacefully. While the others were unconscious, their blood had been drawn for testing. Results would be out in about an hour. Everyone was alarmed on hearing this. Tatiana, particularly worried, asked what they planned to do with Sandra. The colonel said they were preparing to evacuate the next day, and those who were infected would be left to die in the sealed base. This was the only way to prevent the spread of the virus. Before they parted, the colonel reminded them to write a will, just in case. Looking at Sandra in the isolation room, everyone was worried about whether they would follow in her footsteps. Despair spread, and participants who had previously quarreled even started fighting. At this point, a broadcast released the test results. Only three people were not infected, Nikolai, Sergei, and Elena. Everyone was astonished, but they had to accept the result. Soon, some soldiers came in to take Nikolai, Sergei, and Elena, who hadn't been infected. To everyone's surprise, they appeared in the isolation room where Sandra was. It turned out that these three were the real infected ones. The colonel lied just to trick them into the isolation room. The contestants waiting for death saw a glimmer of hope, but most of them didn't feel happy, particularly Tatiana who was upset about Nikolai's impending death. The two had experienced a lot in the cabin and had developed feelings for each other. Just then, an alarm sounded in the room. The colonel rushed over to tell everyone that the virus was spreading more seriously than expected. They decided to evacuate the base earlier. Everyone came to say goodbye to the isolated Nikolai and others. As they were about to leave the base, Suren suddenly grabbed a weapon. He decided to stay and accompany Nikolai, just as Nikolai had never abandoned him. Tatiana also stepped forward in support. The colonel reminded them that the base would be permanently closed in a few minutes. Seeing that they were unmoved, he had to leave the base with the others, while Surin and Tatiana rushed to the isolation room, fired their guns to shatter the glass cover, and the six of them ran towards the base's main gate. Unfortunately, they were a step too late and watched as the iron gate closed. They used all their strength, but the gate didn't budge. Sergei believed that the two doors might be a linked device. Only when the inner protective door is closed can the outer iron door open. Without any hesitation, Sergei closed the inner door. He decided to sacrifice himself to save his teammates. The moment the inner door locked, the outer iron door indeed automatically opened. The five who escaped didn't feel lucky because this was exchanged with a teammate's life. To everyone's surprise, they later met Sergei again in the jungle. Everyone was overjoyed. They found out that Sergei had indeed been stunned by the poison gas after being locked in the base, but he didn't lose his life because of it. After waking up, he escaped from the base through another passage. Everyone was puzzled, guessing that it might be a deliberate arrangement by the showrunners so that there would be enough contestants to continue the survival game. Just as everyone was discussing when the next round of the game would start, they suddenly noticed a yellow bus parked not far away. Perhaps their life on the run was about to end. However, much to everyone's disappointment, the bus had long been abandoned and could not be started. Fortunately, there was a decent amount of food stored inside, providing a brief respite. They stopped worrying about the virus. 
When Sergei came back from gathering firewood, he suddenly felt an intense pain in his arm. He rolled up his sleeve to find a needle mark. It was highly likely that it had been administered while he was unconscious at the base. Sergei dared not mention this to anyone. Just as he was descending into panic and despair, he discovered a wooden boat hidden in the jungle. With this, they could escape the hellish place through the waterway, a method more efficient than trudging over mountains. Just then, a kayak appeared on the river. Everyone put down the wooden boat and hid. After the small boat docked, three people came ashore carrying a box. After countless hardships, the contestants had become more alert. If possible, any strangers they met should be controlled first and questioned later. However, these three individuals didn't look like bad people. They claimed to be geologists from an exploration team, here to collect some mineral samples. Due to a damaged kayak, they had to disembark and travel on foot. Looking at the strange rocks in the wooden box, the contestants lowered their guard, feeling that the strangers posed no significant threat. Nikolai even inquired about information from the leader. He pointed out their current location on the map. If they followed the river downstream, they would reach a seaside town. With the prospect of escape in sight, everyone was in high spirits, even celebrating with drinks. But to their utter disbelief, when they woke up the next day, the three geologists had secretly taken the wooden boat and left. The opportunity to escape had once again slipped through their fingers. Repeated setbacks had everyone on the brink of collapse. Sergei and Nikolai ended up blaming each other and almost came to blows. Just as day broke the next morning, their situation took another unexpected turn. This time, it was a group of fully armed local tribesmen who came ashore. The man leading the group claimed to be the chieftain of a nearby tribe. Seeing Nikolai's cautious demeanor, the chieftain warmly offered a cup of hot tea and invited everyone to visit his tribe. Nikolai, however, was not about to trust a stranger easily. Tentatively, he expressed their intention to continue downstream to a small town. Without any hesitation, the chieftain offered to guide them part of the way. Everyone felt a sudden rush of joy at their good fortune. The chieftain casually asked if they had seen three thieves who had stolen the tribe's gold ore. Nikolai immediately realized that he was likely referring to the three geologists. No wonder they had hastily stolen a boat to escape. Just as Nikolai was about to deny any connection, the chieftain's men found the damaged kayak left behind by the thieves. Now everyone was in hot water, unable to clear their names. The chieftain was adamant that Nikolai and his group were accomplices of the thieves, and he demanded the return of the stolen gold ore. As the chieftain's patience was wearing thin, they all felt their lives hanging by a thread. Sergei then admitted to his association with the thieves, and claimed he could retrieve the gold ore. The chieftain decided to give them a chance. Three of the women were detained as hostages, while Nikolai, Sergei, and three others were to take a boat to bring back the ore in exchange for their release. For safety, the chieftain sent his own son to supervise them and prevent any attempts to escape. Suddenly, Sandra, who had been locked in the car, peeked out and stated that Surin's leg injury made him unsuitable for the journey, and she volunteered to replace him in the search for the ore. After some consideration, the chieftain agreed. However, Surin was filled with bitterness. Everyone knew that being left behind as a hostage would not end well. The three remaining in the car were consumed with worry. The airship was quite fast, and it didn't take long to spot the thieves' wooden boat on a sandbar. They couldn't wait to disembark and follow the tracks. Finally, in a clearing, they found the resting thieves. Unexpectedly, the chieftain's son turned his gun on Nikolai and the others. It turned out he had once visited a large city and had become enamored with its bustle. So he had conspired with the thieves to steal the tribe's gold ore. Infuriated, Nikolai and his group charged at the thieves. They had to retrieve the ore or their captive companions would die. Sandra revealed her powerful strength in this life-or-death moment. However, during the struggle for the weapon, Nikolai accidentally discharged the gun, hitting Sandra in the shoulder. Sergei was instantly enraged. He wrestled the weapon from the chieftain's son, shooting down two of the thieves without mercy. Sandra, wailing in pain, alerted them that someone had run off with the gold ore. Nikolai immediately chased into the forest. With his nimble movements, he quickly caught up with the remaining thief and retrieved the gold ore hidden amongst rocks. But when Nikolai returned to regroup with his companions, Sergei had changed his mind. He wanted to take Sandra to a hospital in the downstream town. Besides, the chieftain's son was dead. 
Returning to negotiate their friend's release could have dire consequences. Nikolai was strongly against this. He didn't want to abandon any teammates. Suddenly, Sandra knocked Nikolai out with a heavy blow. She had a daughter back home and didn't want to die here for nothing. After packing up the ore, Sergei and Sandra set off towards the downstream town. They had to rest after every portion of the journey. Sergei revealed a severe, infected wound on his arm. It turned out that part of his insistence on going to the town's hospital was to seek treatment for himself as well. As they were helping each other down the slope, Sandra lost her footing and tumbled down the hill. They went through a rough journey. After Sergei examined her injuries, he was filled with sorrow. He gripped Sandra's arm, intending to end her life in this harsh way. Perhaps it was to shed the burden, or perhaps it was to relieve her suffering. At that moment, Nikolai emerged, witnessing the scene that had just unfolded. Maddened, Sergei grabbed a shotgun, only to find that it was already devoid of bullets. So the two men resorted to bare muscle wrestling. In the end, Nikolai had the upper hand. He pulled out a screwdriver and thrust it into Sergei's chest. As he watched Sergei on his way to meet Jesus, Nikolai felt no joy, cursing what had led them all to this point of fratricidal killing. He could only let out a roar like a goose to release his frustration. When Nikolai returned to camp with the gold ore, his companions informed him that the chieftain had already left with his men. Nikolai then realized that the supposed gold ore was just a worthless rock. It had all been a trap set by the chieftain. The participants were like puppets on strings, deliberately led to kill each other. Nikolai thought back on the series of events he had experienced, from the sudden appearance of cannibalistic zombies and bandits to the secret lab and local tribes. There was no such coincidence, and after careful consideration, he could see many inconsistencies. Finally, Nikolai realized that everything was a survival game, deliberately arranged by the show organizer. Elsewhere, under the escort of the colonel, Victoria and the others were unaware that they were still part of the game. Not until they reached a tunnel and a sudden explosion occurred. Victoria awoke from unconsciousness after some time, her vision hazy. She saw someone moving bodies. When she reunited with her companions, apart from the soldier who had accompanied them, the only contestant missing was the dreadlocked girl, Marina. Semyon said she must still be alive, but they didn't know who had taken her. Despite their pain, the group continued along the road. Before long, they arrived at an abandoned town. All the buildings bore signs of burning, and the style looked very much like something from the 60s. But the entire town was deserted, with no trace of human activity. Semyon thought the previous car accident was strange, and now they had inexplicably arrived at this town. He believed they shouldn't stay here for long. However, his companions didn't agree. The missing marina might be nearby, and they had to search for her no matter what. Semyon cursed their stupidity, left his companions, and walked away. He knew the surrounding area was a vast, uninhabited region, and they would need to find a vehicle to leave. Victoria and Andre were scouring the streets, looking for any trace of Marina, when unexpectedly, a dog appeared before them, showing that there were other people living nearby. Unknowingly, the two had arrived at the town's police station. Perhaps they would find some useful information here. Just as expected, Andre found a logbook entry dated April 26, 1992, stating that an explosion at the research base had caused a nuclear radiation and toxic gas leak, forcing the entire town to evacuate. Victoria, on the other hand, came across a wanted criminal referred to as the Butcher. Meanwhile, Marina awoke from unconsciousness, only to find the dried, broken branches and herself secured in a water pit. Suddenly, a big man approached. His gaze upon Marina was akin to a greedy butcher. Marina could only pretend to be unconscious, daring not to move. Yet when she heard the sound of meat being chopped from the adjacent bed, she couldn't help but let out a fearful wail. But the butcher seemed to ignore her, coming straight to where Marina lay and picking up the bloody saw. Then the agonized moan from the neighboring bed once again drew the butcher's attention. Marina took the opportunity to break free, but before she could escape, the butcher turned back around. As he approached, Marina kicked him hard in the leg, followed by a deadly blow to his private but smelly part that knocked him to the ground. She then broke a window and escaped from the house. The butcher tried to chase after her, but tripped over a steel pipe on the ground, hitting his head on the stairs and passing out. Marina had no time to feel relieved. Following the only source of light in town, she miraculously reunited with Victoria and the others. After hearing Marina's account, Victoria concluded that the big man was the butcher wanted by the police station. He was once a surgeon, but after the tragic death of his wife, he was driven to madness, taking pleasure in killing. 
His favorite pastime was setting up traps for people to kill each other. After hearing Marina's story, everyone was horrified and agreed they should leave this place as soon as possible. Early the next morning, they were roused by the roaring sound of a car engine. Unexpectedly, Semyon had indeed found a car, and he didn't choose to abandon his companions. The group piled into the car in high spirits, thinking they could finally escape this nightmare. However, not long after they drove out of the town, the car suddenly broke down, making them curse why it was not a Tesla. Up ahead, the butcher, wearing a gas mask, shockingly threw two gas bombs at them, causing the group to instantly pass out. When Semyon woke up, he found himself and Victoria trapped in a cage over the sea, separated by an iron door. Victoria deduced this was a trap set by the butcher for them to escape. She had a key around her neck, which she hadn't had before passing out, and without a doubt, it was the only way to open the cage. However, when the key was inserted into the lock of the separating door, the cage didn't open, but instead began to descend slowly towards the sea. Semyon noticed he had a lock on his side too, and asked Victoria to give him the key to try. But Victoria quickly realized that if Semyon opened the cage and escaped, she would be left trapped. The old man was desperate, even trying to snatch the key. Victoria was even less willing to hand over the key now. She noticed an iron box under Semyon and suggested that it might contain a key to the dividing door. Semyon tried it, but the box was filled with broken glass. Victoria confirmed her suspicion and asked Semyon to get the key from the iron box in exchange. Seeing Semyon unwilling to take the risk, Victoria kicked the separating door in desperation, causing the cage to stand upright. Semyon, now at the bottom, was thoroughly panicked and had to reach into the iron box again, pulling out the glass shards bit by bit. Just as the cage was nearing the sea surface, Semyon finally found a key and tried to open the door beneath him, but the key didn't match. He had no choice but to hand it over to Victoria, whose hands were shaking. To their despair, the key still couldn't open the separating door. Victoria broke down into tears like a giant baby, seeing her doom was certain. She then gave Semyon the key around her neck, thinking if one of them could escape, it was worth it. As the lower half of the cage was immersed in the sea, the moment he unlocked the door beneath him, the separating door miraculously opened. After Victoria emerged from the water, she gulped down fresh air. But the game was not over yet. As the two of them struggled to climb onto the platform, the butcher appeared before them. Semyon picked up a steel bar and charged at him, but was quickly knocked down. Victoria stepped forward to fight using her skinny muscles, and Semyon suddenly got up and trapped the butcher, allowing Victoria to deliver the final blow. Looking at the lifeless body of the butcher, Victoria realized that if she had given the key to Semyon directly in the cage, they would have successfully escaped earlier. But then she wondered where their other companions had gone. On the other side, the other four participants were trapped inside a sealed glass room. Two thick chains ran through a central iron ring, each end shackled to an individual's ankle. All eyes turned to the rusty saw in the corner, in fear that the only way to escape was to saw off their own leg. Suddenly, someone spotted a key hanging overhead, but it was so high that they couldn't reach. They could only scream for help in desperation. In the empty room, a camera was the only sign of life. To add to their despair, a hole in the corner suddenly began gushing seawater, and no matter how they tried to plug it, it was to no avail. Marina saw a glimmer of hope. Once the water level was high enough, they could reach the key. However, as the water gradually rose, the two-meter-long chain couldn't allow both ends to float at the same time. One person must dive underwater, allowing their partner to float on the surface and breathe. In this back-and-forth manner, they could ensure all four could survive until the key could be reached. At first, the two pairs worked well together, but a man was too nervous and couldn't hold his breath long enough. Seeing the other girl about to run out of air underwater, Marina shook the chain, prompting the man to dive hurriedly, allowing the girl to surface for air. But in his panic, he got tangled in the chain underwater. His companions dived down to help, but the chain became more entangled. The poor man lost his chance to surface, and by the time the girl returned, he had already become a lifeless body. The rest were filled with sorrow. Marina felt the water level was about right. With the help of his companions, she finally reached the hanging key. She immediately dived underwater and finally opened the iron ring on her ankle. Due to the urgency, the key fell into the lock. The girl dived to search for it, but sadly her vision was too blurred. She brushed past the key that was within her reach. At this point, Marina had climbed out of the isolation chamber. She tried to smash the glass with an iron rod, hoping that the man could still be saved. 
Andre quickly dived underwater and found the key, opening the iron ring. When he came up for air, he handed the key to the trapped girl, urging her to dive down and unlock the shackle. But overly tense, the girl accidentally broke the key. The water level had now exceeded the length of the iron chain, and she couldn't swim up to the surface for air. Underwater, Andre tried to break it with his hands and bite it with his teeth, but it was to no avail. Marina, outside the glass room, was almost in despair, continuously swinging the iron rod until she was out of breath, and the glass remained unbroken. Eventually, the two had to give up on the rescue, watching helplessly as the trapped girl stopped struggling. After Andre climbed out of the glass room, he sorrowfully glanced at the two dead companions and left the room with Marina. As they just stepped out of the main door, they ran into Semyon and Victoria, who had managed to escape the danger. Initially, there were six contestants who had left with the army, and in less than a day, two were lost. Victoria was on the verge of breaking down. Just then, the sound of a motorboat engine came from the seaside. It was Nikolai, arriving with the remaining three contestants. Victoria thought it was too much of a coincidence. Nikolai explained that he had been guided here by a geologist. Without a doubt, these were traps set by the showrunners. It was just unexpected that they would be so cruel, killing the participants in this way. During their conversation, a helicopter roared in from the distance. A man dressed as a coast guard jumped down. He said he was looking for a missing child and asked if anyone needed help. Seeing a chance to escape, Elena was anxious and urged everyone to get on the helicopter, but Victoria sat still in her spot. This could be another game arranged by the showrunners. She was determined to break the game rules. Nikolai shared her thoughts, but Victoria urged him to leave. The others wouldn't last without Nikolai. Thus, Nikolai left with the others in the helicopter while Victoria sat there, looking contemplatively at the sky. It wasn't long before the helicopter arrived at another seaside town. The mayor, having received the news, personally ran to the helipad to welcome Semyon, who got on the bus. He claimed that everyone was just lost tourists. Nikolai decided to probe further, expressing a desire to use a mobile phone to assure his family of his safety. But the phone the mayor handed over had no signal. The bus driver explained that the signal tower had been damaged by yesterday's typhoon. Nikolai and Tatiana exchanged a glance but said nothing. Semyon took the opportunity to ask to use a landline. The driver cooperatively drove the bus to the post office, but the staff there said that yesterday's typhoon had severed the cable and communication workers were working on repairs. The contestants now believed that this could very well be another setup. Still not convinced, Semyon found an excuse to slip away during a meal and casually asked a waiter for information, but her phone was also unable to get a signal. Just then, Semyon saw a few people walking towards the restaurant. He hurried back to the table and learned that the people who had come were were the town's sheriff. The missing child that the helicopter had been searching for was his daughter. The sheriff was evidently invested in this case and found the identity of the contestants suspicious. Not getting the answers he wanted, he purposefully left his deputy to watch over everyone. After lunch, the mayor brought everyone to the hospital to treat their wounds. The doctor had just given Nikolai an injection of anti-inflammatory medication when he suddenly fainted. Although the hospital explained that it was an allergic shock, the contestants had been through too many deceptions. Semyon felt that a new round of the show's game had begun. He told everyone not to keep dancing to their tune and to abandon the unconscious Nikolai and leave the town tonight. The others agreed, except for Tatiana and Suren, who chose to stay. They didn't expect the escape team to arrive at the town port smoothly. The four of them randomly chose a cargo ship, planning to escape by water, only to find another person in the cargo hold. Semyon didn't hesitate to knock him out with a wrench, but at that moment, a loud siren sounded. Marina instantly vanished, and Semyon handed the bloody wrench to Andre. As expected, though Semyon and the others were taken back to the police station, Andre became the focus of attention. Back at the hospital, Nikolai finally woke up from his unconscious state. He and Tatiana didn't have time to share a tender moment before the sheriff burst in and took them away. Semyon and his group's failed escape attempt had implicated them, too. The only one who wasn't caught was Marina, who had unknowingly fled to a repair factory, only to be quickly targeted by a few brutal workers. Just as they were about to play some smelly games with her, Victoria suddenly charged out with a weapon, causing the workers to flee the scene. Marina was puzzled by Victoria's sudden appearance. 
Victoria then began to recount her previous experiences. After parting with everyone, Victoria had returned to the previous dock warehouse. In an office, she saw two computer screens, one facing the iron cage and the other the glass room that had almost killed them. Victoria's suspicions were confirmed. All of the contestants' experiences were monitored by the show's crew. She then picked up the gun on the desk. The only current solution to break the situation was to destroy all obstacles. However, she didn't expect to run into Marina in danger shortly after arriving in the town. While the two were catching up, a figure with a gun suddenly appeared behind them. It was the sheriff who had tracked them from the dock. After the deputy seized Victoria's weapon, he asked if they were also the contestants. On the other hand, Andre, who was framed by Semyon as a murderer, was interrogated by the sheriff, who wanted to know where their group came from and whether their overnight escape had anything to do with his missing daughter. Andre was at his wit's end. He genuinely didn't know the whereabouts of the missing child. Faced with Andre's refusal to confess, the sheriff had no choice but to lock the others in an abandoned mall. Only when someone confessed would they be set free. Everyone accused Semyon of committing the murder and framing Andre. However, Semyon didn't care at all. He thought that this was just a game set up by the show's crew, and Andre's life wasn't really in danger. Nikolai, annoyed, agitated Semyon, who immediately expressed his dislike for sharing a room with everyone. He planned to find a way to break out forcefully. On the other side, Victoria and Marina willingly followed the deputy to a concealed apartment. They were nothing short of shocked. This was the first time they had heard an outsider mention the name of the survival game. Therefore, the deputy shared an old tale. Last summer, while patrolling, he encountered three people in the forest dressed in uniforms like Victoria's. They claimed to be participants in a multiplayer game and had faced all sorts of bizarre scenarios, like zombies and laboratories. In the end, only the three of them survived. However, within a few days, security personnel came and took the surviving contestants away. A few months later, locals found two of the three bodies in the forest. When he tried to contact and investigate the security personnel, he discovered that their identities were all fake. Victoria became agitated, asking if there was a young girl with the tattoo on her back among the dead. The deputy thought for a moment and told her that the two who died were others. The whereabouts of the tattooed girl were unknown. Unknowingly, Victoria was already in tears. It turns out the tattooed girl was her younger sister, and her reason for participating in this round of competition was to find her missing sister. Marina also became agitated. Victoria had known from the start that this was a deadly game, but never told anyone else. Otherwise, so many innocent participants wouldn't have died in vain. The deputy tried to calm her down, claiming he had a friend in the suburbs with a plane who could help everyone escape. But at this point, Marina didn't dare to trust anyone. She pointed a gun at the deputy and fired. After leaving the apartment, she went straight to the town post office, asking the staff to connect her with her mother in Moscow. The clerk shrank back a bit, but actually started dialing the number. Not long after, they informed her that the call was connected and transferred to the second communication room. Marina picked up the receiver, only to realize she had been tricked. The clerk had already run out of the post office and locked the door from outside. Marina collapsed on the floor in despair, wondering why people just can't be honest with each other. Meanwhile, Victoria had already bandaged the deputy's wound. Luckily, Marina's shooting skills were poor, and she hadn't hit a vital spot. Immediately, the two set off in their car to find their teammates. Suddenly, the sheriff's voice came over the radio, saying they had captured a suspect at the post office in connection with the missing child. The suspect was armed with a submachine gun, the same one the teacher who disappeared with the child had been using. Victoria instantly realized the captured suspect was Marina. The deputy beside her quietly drew his pistol. He knew that the weapon actually belonged to Victoria, and she might be the real suspect. Victoria was forced to pull the car over and explain that she had found the weapon at the butcher's factory. She explained everything that happened earlier, and the deputy finally eased his suspicions and gave her the specific address of his pilot friend. He urged Victoria to drive her companions away as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, the sheriff had taken Marina back to the station. He wanted to know where the gun came from and where his missing daughter was hidden. Marina didn't know how to explain and remained silent. The sheriff was furious and prepared to use force to make her talk. But Andre knew what was coming and quickly confessed to the crime. The sheriff then opened the cage to bring him into the interrogation room. 
Unexpectedly, Andre quickly went to pick up the gun on the table and threatened the sheriff to release Marina. Just then, the phone in the station rang. The sheriff's subordinate answered the call, and it was the sheriff's child on the line. Hearing that his daughter was still alive, the sheriff quickly claimed it was all a misunderstanding. Andre, suspicious of the coincidence, shot the sheriff and his subordinate with two quick shots. Just as he was preparing to escape with Marina, he was hit by the policeman's dying shot. The girl's anxious voice calling out for her father echoed from the phone. Marina had just run out of the station when she came across Victoria, who was on her way to rescue the other participants. Meanwhile, Semyon, trapped in the mall, secretly held a steel nail in his hand. As soon as the guard outside the door came close, he lunged forward and stabbed him. The remaining guard was also killed, but a stray bullet hit Tatiana on the stairs. Nikolai stepped forward, glaring angrily, but to his surprise, Semyon pointed the gun at his own teammate. He believed that he could survive and win the game without a team. Just then, Victoria walked in with her pistol. Semyon ignored the threat, but with the sound of a gunshot, Semyon fell to the ground. Victoria had finally pulled the trigger. Semyon held Victoria's hand and urged her to survive. For the old man, perhaps this kind of ending was a good release from suffering. Victoria drove the remaining participants out of the small town in the middle of the night. They found the deputy's pilot friend and prepared to fly to the nearest city. It wasn't until they were high in the sky that everyone finally felt secured. But the next day, Victoria woke up to find the pilot had disappeared from the cockpit. Apparently, they had fallen into the show's trap once again. Nikolai rushed into the cockpit to try to control the plane, but the steering wheel had been locked. It was only a matter of time before the plane would crash. Parachuting was the only way out. Elena mentioned her husband was a paratrooper. After demonstrating how to parachute once, she was the first to jump out of the plane. Marina and Suren gritted their teeth and followed closely behind. Victoria hesitantly looked at Nikolai and Tatiana. There was only one parachute left for the two. Without hesitation, Nikolai handed the only parachute to Tatiana. He claimed he had a way to save himself, then went back to the cockpit. Tatiana's wound was still bleeding, but her eyes were fixed on Nikolai's back. She had always thought that sacrificing one's life for others was a false sentiment until today. Victoria understood Tatiana's choice, slowly loosened her clenched hands. Standing at the door of the cabin, Tatiana told Nikolai to survive and then jumped out of the plane. Nikolai was completely stunned. He hadn't expected Tatiana to choose death and leave the chance of survival to him. Victoria shouted a reminder not to let Tatiana's sacrifice be in vain before jumping off the plane. Sometime later, when Victoria surfaced from the sea, she saw Nikolai had also jumped. Fortunately, he hadn't done anything foolish, but the current situation was not optimistic. As far as the eye could see, there was a vast ocean. Even with their parachutes acting as life rings, the freezing seawater would eventually kill them. But Victoria was not at all panicked. She already understood the rules of the game. As long as the participants were valuable enough, the organizers wouldn't let them die. Sure enough, in less than 10 minutes, a fishing boat appeared on the horizon. Victoria and Nikolai were successfully rescued. They climbed onto the deck to see the three who had parachuted earlier were already wrapped in blankets, sipping hot coffee. When the crew left, Nikolai asked everyone about their rescue process. The first to board the rescue ship was Marina, who said she was spotted by the fishing boat right after his jump. Nikolai became even more convinced that all of this was no coincidence. It's still a part of the setup game. He was boiling with rage over the loss of Tatiana, and now was the time to let it out. Nikolai quickly subdued several crew members one by one, and then stormed into the cockpit and took the captain hostage. His men were shocked by Nikolai's ferocity, but did not interfere as he interrogated the captain. But the captain was tight-lipped, insisting that he had been fishing nearby, and that their encounter was pure coincidence. He added that he was their savior. Nikolai softened a bit, keeping his gun pointed at the captain's knee, but not pulling the trigger. After a moment of struggle, he decided to question the other crew members first. Soon after, Nikolai emerged from the cargo hold, having obtained the answers he wanted. Handing his gun to Victoria, he used a fire axe to cut the ropes binding the captain. But in the next moment, Nikolai swung the axe and chopped off one of the captain's fingers. It turns out, the crew had confessed that this was not their regular route, but the captain had specifically ordered them to come here. Seeing Seeing Nikolai ready to continue chopping fingers, the captain finally confessed the truth. They were actually hired to come to this area with many cameras installed on the 
ship. By far, every participant confirmed that the previous plane crash and the current sea rescue were all games arranged by the showrunners. Fortunately, they had finally cracked the game and removed all the cameras, which made everyone feel much safer. The captain further revealed that the showrunners had paid a large sum of money and instructed him not to disclose any information. He had received coordinates from the showrunners not long ago and came to rescue everyone. Nikolai couldn't help but wonder how the show organizer knew their location. There must be a mole sending information to them. Nikolai pointed his gun at his companions, demanding that everyone take off their clothes. He wanted to check who was carrying a communication device. Everyone had no choice but to comply, albeit angrily and unwillingly. But Victoria grabbed the gun and reminded Nikolai to stay calm. This might be exactly what the show organizer wanted to see. Nikolai slumped to the ground, defeated. The following day, at the crack of dawn, the fishing boat did not dock at the planned port. Instead, they chose another harbor, which was the only way to evade the surveillance. The group found a gas station to purchase supplies, but just as they were checking out, a news report aired on the TV. Nikolai and his group were now fugitives, wanted for killing a police officer in a small town. Sensing trouble, the group was about to flee when a police car appeared behind them. With a shared understanding, they split into three groups, each heading in a different direction. By the time they regrouped, it was already late at night. They found an abandoned theater and planned to spend the night there. After taking some food, they began to suspect that there must be a mole among the five of them. Marina suddenly turned to Victoria, accusing her of knowing from the start that this was a deadly game. Yet she never told anyone. Victoria explained that she actually knew very little. Her younger sister disappeared after participating in a survival game a year ago. She only joined this game after discovering the registration phone number in her sister's email. Victoria pointed out that there was no trust left among them, which was perhaps what the game manipulator wanted to see. Elena didn't care about that. She said everyone had been searched and no communication devices were found. Could there be a tracking chip implanted in someone's body? As it happened, there was a stitched wound on Surin's leg. Nikolai thought this was possible and planned to open his wound to check. Surin became flustered and attempted to limp away, but he tripped and fell, impaled by a steel pipe, and died instantly. Everyone retreated in shock except for Elena, who calmly went to pick up a piece of glass and sliced open Surin's calf. After a while, she placed a bloody tracking chip on the armrest. It turned out that Surin was indeed the mole. Nikolai was filled with rage and raised his gun to smash the chip, but Victoria stopped him. Keeping the chip could make the puppet master believe that they were still under control. Shortly afterwards, the group found a truck and quietly returned to Moscow. There, they secretly met Marina's boyfriend, who held an executive position in a well-known media company. They hoped he could expose the crimes of the show organizer. However, upon seeing Marina, her boyfriend felt dumbfounded. When they returned to his place and turned on the TV, they understood why. The news had reported half a month ago that all participants and staff of the survival game died in a plane crash. The charred bodies had been genetically identified. Everyone was devastated by how powerful the organization was to fabricate such a realistic death illusion. No wonder the deaths of more than a dozen contestants hadn't attracted any public attention. Marina hoped her boyfriend could reveal the crimes of the show in the media. If the contestants were exposed to the public, it wouldn't be so easy for the puppet master to kill them. However, her boyfriend was worried that the organization behind this was too powerful. Right now, it was best for everyone to stay hidden, or they could be in danger at any time. Later, Marina approached her boyfriend alone. The reason she joined the survival show was that she was pregnant with his child. Knowing her boyfriend wouldn't agree to marry her, she planned to give birth to the child with the reward. Upon hearing this, her boyfriend was filled with guilt. He stated that he would go to his boss to discuss the matter. The pragmatic Victoria didn't think this was likely to succeed. Her main reason for joining the show was to find her missing sister. She had previously copied past data from the show's team in the camp. Although it contained an interview video of her sister, there were no clues about her disappearance. Victoria believed that she could only find her missing sister by participating in the game. Just then, a piece of news popped up on the webpage. It was a photo of a family being shot to death. Many people criticized the photographer for not attempting to save them. Nikolai then confessed his secret to Victoria. The photographer in the news, the one who didn't try to save those lives, was Nikolai himself. The little girl who was killed had given him a towel just before. But when her family was murdered, Nikolai was stunned, unable to think of saving them. He was overwhelmed with guilt afterwards, even resorting to pills to numb himself. He was so out of it that he didn't even notice his pregnant wife hemorrhaging. By the time he woke up, both his wife and unborn child were dead. 
This pushed him to the edge, causing a mental breakdown. That's why he joined this survival game. He wanted to end his suffering during the game. Meanwhile, Elena sitting in the bathtub was treating a wound on her leg. It turns out the tracker chip wasn't removed from Suren's leg, but from Elena's. Unbelievably, Elena was the mole hidden among the contestants. Victoria suggested they should go to the show's headquarters. Nikolai accompanied her, instructing the two remaining to avoid contact with the outside world. When they arrived at their destination, they found the place deserted. On a memorial wall at the entrance were pictures of 16 participants. Looking at the familiar faces, Nikolai and Victoria got a heavy heart. They understood that all of this was just the show organizer's deception. Nikolai didn't plan to sit idly by. He borrowed a phone from a passerby intending to seek help from a former superior. They agreed to meet in a park, but the person who showed up wasn't his superior, but an unexpected girl. She told him that his superior wasn't coming. Clearly, she had intercepted Nikolai's call. Nikolai recognized her as the first participant who was supposed to have died in the game. She had stood up to a gunman and been killed at that time. Her fake death was just to enhance the realism of the game and to instill fear in the participants. She advised Nikolai not to oppose the show team. Instead, she advised him to find a way to complete the game. Nikolai sat in silence for a long time, overwhelmed by the showrunner's pervasiveness. Meanwhile, Marina, waiting for news at the residence, was worried that the news of her death would take on her mother. She wanted to go home to check on her. Elena volunteered to accompany her, but when Marina arrived at her home and knocked, there was no answer. A cleaning lady nearby informed them that the homeowner had recently passed away from grief over her daughter's tragic accident. Upon hearing this, Marina collapsed, overcome with shock. Elena comforted her while helping her away from the stairs. Just as they were leaving, the front door was pushed open. A community worker informed an elderly woman behind her that there was no one outside. The cleaning lady confirmed that no one had been there. It turned out that not only the contestants, but also their family members were being manipulated. Marina was being constantly reassured by Elena. However, Elena slipped up and mentioned Marina's mother's name, which Marina had never mentioned to anyone before. Only a mole planted by the show would have access to such detailed information about the contestants. Marina tried to distance herself from Elena. Panicked, Elena confessed that Marina's mother was still alive and urged her to return. The news was so unexpected that Marina stood there in shock, only to be hit by a speeding car and killed on the spot. Elena rushed to the lifeless body, apologizing incessantly, filled with guilt. But when Victoria returned to their residence alone, Elena was like a changed person. She was confident of her impending victory in the game. Victoria noticed the scar on Elena's leg and instantly realized her mole identity. Without a second thought, she threw a punch, knocking the preening Elena unconscious. As midnight approached, Elena awoke from her stupor, realizing she was effectively a prisoner. With no other choice, she confessed that she was originally just a chef, but becoming an actress had been her lifelong dream. To prove her acting skills to a skeptical director, she took a different path and participated in the survival game, winning the previous competition through her superb acting. However, the end of her lucky streak was also the start of a nightmare. The show's rules stated that as long as the contestants were alive, they must continue to play the game indefinitely. But Victoria only wanted to know whether her sister participating in the previous game was still alive. However, Elena was clueless about this and reminded Victoria that the showrunners would answer any of her questions if she won the game. This answer infuriated Victoria. She gripped Elena's greasy neck, venting her frustration and anger until Elena finally stopped breathing. Victoria's emotions then slightly subsided. At that moment, Nikolai arrived from outside. Seeing the body on the floor and Victoria holding a gun, he was momentarily confused. Suddenly the phone on the table rang. Nikolai answered it on speaker. It was Marina's boyfriend, who had contacted the media and invited Nikolai and the others to meet at a subway station to expose the crimes of the showrunners. Victoria dropped the gun and burst into tears in Nikolai's arms. She was sick of this game, which now only had two contestants left out of the original 16. When Nikolai and Victoria arrived at the agreed-upon subway station, they eerily found that the usually bustling crowd had disappeared, and even the station's elevators had stopped working. Suddenly, a subway train slowly pulled into the station. A familiar figure stepped out from the carriage. It was the show's host, who was supposedly torn apart by zombies at the beginning of the show. Nikolai and Victoria managed to stay calm, as they were already used to the show's tricks. They were just infuriated by why so many people had to die. The host's answer was surprising. The showrunners hadn't directly killed anyone. All had died from infighting. As for the personnel outside the contestants, they were either criminals on death row or actors faking their deaths. 
On careful recollection, Nikolai realized that this seemed to be true. The host then announced that it was time for the final showdown. He opened the box in his hand, revealing two guns. Without a doubt, this was meant to pit Nikolai and Victoria against each other. Only the last survivor could win. Nikolai, unwilling to be manipulated by the showrunners, stayed put, advising Victoria to do the same. However, the host revealed that Victoria's sister was still alive, leaving Victoria with no choice but to pick up the gun from the box. She had to win the game to find her sister. Yet Nikolai seemed eerily calm. He no longer wanted to merely survive, and he wished Victoria luck in finding her sister. With tears in her eyes, Victoria raised the gun. However, after the gunshot, it was Victoria who fell. Nikolai watched the scene in disbelief. The host further explained that the true winner was the one who stayed true to themselves. Apparently, Victoria had made the wrong choice. The host congratulated Nikolai for being the ultimate winner. Nikolai, however, was seething with anger. He picked up the fallen gun and aimed it at the host, denouncing their inhumanity. A gunshot rang out, and Nikolai felt everything go black. The guns had been specially modified to fire bullets from the back. When he woke up again, he was in a hospital bed. The doctor explained that the showrunner's plane had crashed, and all the staff and contestants had perished, except for Nikolai, who had luckily survived. However, he had suffered a head injury and lost part of his memory. Then a police officer handed him a new set of identification and a bank card. After his discharge, the penniless Nikolai decided to withdraw some money, only to find a whopping 1 million euros in the account, the exact amount promised by the show as the championship prize. A message appeared on the screen. Congratulations on reaching the second level. Not far behind Nikolai stood a woman who looked remarkably like Victoria, presumably the sister Victoria had been searching for, hinting that everything will be explained in the second season. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.